this video, we're going to be looking at discrete random variables and some of their properties. So uh, we talked earlier in the quarter about what exactly is a random variable. So if you recall, a random variable is just uh, any variable whose outcomes are determined by probability. And specifically in this video, we're going to focus on discrete random variables. And uh, as you can recall, a discrete value is anything that can only take on uh, distinct interval values, such as uh, things that you can only have 0 or 1 or 2 or 3 of. So a discrete random variable is a random variable that can only have uh, discrete outcomes. And typically we denote those by capital letters like x, y, or z. So um, one example I always like to do with my students is I like to observe how many siblings does everyone have because the number of siblings is certainly a discrete variable. Um, you certainly wouldn't claim like 1.75 siblings. You would only claim none or one or two or three. So in one of my sections of Math 146, which is probability and statistics, I asked each of my 26 students who were attending that day how many siblings they had. And I constructed a frequency table to outline those results. So you can see here um, that three people had no siblings, seven people had one sibling, nine people had two siblings, uh, four people had three siblings, two people had four, nobody had five actually in this class, but one person, uh, they did have six. So uh, we could take that frequency distribution and we could actually turn it into a relative frequency distribution. So that's uh, something that we practice in chapter two. So for example, you can see here, uh, I have all my frequencies and then we can divide each of those frequencies uh, by the total. So if there's 26 students, right? So then we would say, uh, right, so three here, we would do three divided by 26 and that would be 0.1154. All right, and I do that for each of these topics. So about 27% had one sibling because that was seven out of 26. About 34, 35% had, had two siblings. That was nine out of 26. So we turn this into a relative frequency distribution. We're just reporting the proportions rather than the actual uh, counts over here. Okay, all right. So uh, if you notice, when we turn this into a relative frequency distribution, what we actually have now is uh, we have sort of like a probability chart, right? If I was going to randomly select a student from the classroom, um, there's about an 11, 11 and a half percent chance that I'd end up with someone with no siblings. There's about a 15 percent chance I'd end up with someone that has three siblings, right? And actually, uh, we would have a name for this. We would call this chart the probability distribution of the number of siblings if you're going to randomly select one student. So a probability distribution, it's not just for discrete random variables, but in our case, we're just going to stick to discrete for this particular video. Um, what it does is, is it's just a way to convey all the possible outcomes and their probabilities of occurring. So remember, we use these capital letters to denote random variables. So in our case, like where we were looking at number of sibling data, um, then if we called x to be the number of siblings for randomly selected student, then we could write out the probability distribution here. So in the first column, I list out all the possible values of x because the number of siblings could be anywhere from 0 to 6. And in this column, I list out how likely they are to occur. All right? And this is a probability distribution of a discrete random variable. Typically, for discrete random variables, a probability distribution is always going to look like a table. All the outcomes here, all the probabilities right next to them. All right. So you'll recall back uh, when we first started talking about the distribution of data, so back when we were constructing graphs or uh, uh, calculating summary statistics, we said two of the things that we're interested in in distributions are measures of center and then measures of spread. Um, what I want to know is, could we calculate the mean and the standard deviation of a discrete random variable? Well, let's think back to our uh, sibling data. So in our sibling data, we had our frequencies, right? So we could actually turn this back into the raw data, right? Because when I collected this data, there was three people who had um, no siblings, right? So I would have a zero, zero, zero. Sorry, that's not very good handwriting. I'm just using my mouse. But uh, anyways, we could actually turn this back into the raw data, right? You can see here, right, I would have 
three zeros, seven ones, uh, nine people with two siblings, four people with three siblings, two people with four siblings, and one person with six siblings, right? And if I have the raw data, then from the stuff we uh, learned when calculating summary statistics, I could certainly calculate uh, the mean and standard deviation. So if I treat my class like a population, we could calculate the mean, right, add up all those values, divide by 26, and we would get an average number of students, 1.96 or an average number of siblings of 1.96. And similarly, we could use like the computing formula or uh, possibly stat crunch, and we could calculate the standard deviation. We'd see there'd be a standard deviation of 1.34 siblings, okay? Um, now, I wanna look at the mean here because I think we can reformat this to potentially make it look uh, like something familiar. So uh, the mean, right here where we summed up all our observations uh, out of 26. I could rewrite that, right, because there was three zeros and there were seven people with one sibling and nine people with two siblings, four people with three, two people with four, nobody with five and, and one person with six, right? So what I'm doing is rather than writing out all the individual terms, okay, rather than writing all the individual terms like I did here, uh, I'm just saying, I'm just grouping them together. Three zeros, seven ones, uh, nine twos, okay? All right, well, if I do that, then notice that this is just a sum divided by 26. So if that's the case, I could just divide 26 into each term, right? Divide 26 here, here, and here. And it would look like this, right? So this would be 3 divided by 26 times 0, 7 divided by 26 times 1. You might say, okay, okay, Ryan, why would you actually do that? And the reason is, is because if I actually perform those divisions, and get the decimals, uh, these values should look really familiar. In fact, these values are exactly the same values that we saw in the probability distribution when we showed each outcome and then its probability of occurring, right? So, so we have the probability of zero siblings times zero. We have the probability of one sibling times one. Probability of two siblings times two and so on and so forth. So to calculate the mean, it's almost like we can just take each outcome times its probability, outcome times probability, outcome times probability, and then just sum them all up. And it turns out, actually, that's always the case. So if you have a discrete random variable, then you can calculate the mean just by summing up each outcome times its probability. Sometimes the mean is also referred to as its uh, expected value. And uh, this application comes up in a lot of places, but particularly in places where um, money is involved. So we could look at an example like playing roulette. So in roulette, you basically have a big old wheel, and the wheel has um, 38 slots. So in all those 38 slots, you have two greens. So you can see here a zero and a double zero across from each other. And then you have alternating red and blacks. So there's 36 of those, uh, 18 are red, 18 are black, and they're labeled one through 36, okay? So this is what it looks like. And um, what happens is some of the bets are more uh, likely to win than others. You could bet on red, you could bet on green, you could bet on even numbers, odd numbers, multiples of three, whatever you wanna bet on. But how you bet affects what the payout is. So let's say that you bet on red, okay? So if you're gonna bet on red, that means you're going to bet that the ball is going to land in one of these 18 red spots out of the 38 spots total. And uh, the payout on a red bet, well, red bet's pretty, actually, you're pretty likely to win a red bet, 18 out of 38. So the payout's not huge. The payout's one to one. So for every dollar you bet, you'll get a dollar back if you win. So basically, you're either going to walk around away from that table, either down a dollar or up a dollar. So what I want to know is what would be the expected value of a $5 bet on red? Okay. And remember, we say expected value. Expected value is just another way to say average or mean. Okay, so let's think about this. What we need to do is we need to turn our winnings or our outcomes into a probability distribution. Okay, so when you think about playing this game and you're making a $5 bet on red, there's really only two possibilities. You're gonna win and you're gonna come ahead, out ahead five bucks, or you're gonna lose and you're gonna come out down five bucks. Right? Well, what's the probability of this happening? Well, you're winning when you land on a red, so that's 
going to happen 18 out of 38 times. And you're losing when you don't get a red, and that's the other 28 out of 38 slots. So once you have the probability distribution constructed, then we can actually calculate the expected value because it's just another name for the mean. So I want to calculate the mean of this random variable. I'll just take each outcome times this probability. So we have a positive $5 with an 18 out of 38 chance, plus a negative $5, that's a $5 loss, with a 20 out of 38 chance. And if you add those up, you should become able to come up with an expected value of about a 29 cent negative value. And uh, what does that actually mean? So what that actually means is that you should expect to lose 29 cents on average each time you make a $5 bet on red and roulette. And now, obviously, we can't actually ever win or lose uh, $5 or 29 cents, right? Um, you're either going to win five or you're going to lose five. What the 29 cents talks about is that if you play this game over and over and over and over again, you're going to have a lot of $5 wins and even more $5 losses. And over time, if you average those out, eventually you're going to end up with a 29 cent average loss. And this is bad for you, but this is actually great for casino because the casino knows that in the long run, every single time someone places a bet on red, um, they make 29 cents, right? They can put it in the bank. They can mark it down on their, on their uh, revenue sheets because they know it's going to happen in the long run. Um, this also tells us that um, your expected value in the long run is negative. So that means that the more you play, actually, the more likely you are to lose on average. So as a gambling strategy, not that there is much of a strategy at all, this actually tells us that if you want the best chance of uh, making money at the casino, your best bet is to make as few bets as possible. So you would essentially want to find uh, a really good bet, put all your money down on one single bet, and then uh, just walk away after one bet, even if you win, because the longer you play, the closer you're going to get to the expected value of the bet, which in this case is going to be negative, uh, which actually in all cases at a casino would be negative. All right, so uh, 